E Radio. Hello and welcome to Tech Plus. It is uh, good to be with you again. Uh, our wrap of uh, the week's biggest tech stories in 60 minutes. Hello to you, Kane. How's it going? Hey, Jan. Thanks for having me. Always, uh, always doing well. How about yourself? No, I'm, I'm doing well, man. It's been a long week. Been a long week. Yeah, because it wasn't. We didn't have any public holidays, and then <laughs> and then load shedding also came. Apparently, we jinxed it again. People are blaming us. No, threatening me with violence. This time, I feel responsible because when <laughs> we were talking about it last week, I was like, I shouldn't, but I'm going to. And then we now we have load shedding. So. Well, new uh, listeners, uh, we have uh, a, a situation where we talk about load shedding, and then. There's no load shedding, but then the minute we talk about it, then it happens within a few <laughs> hours after the show. And that happened again this time around. I think uh, we only speak about load shedding while being load shedded. Okay, but it is, we're being shedded right yeah, now. Yeah, now we're free. It's free. <laughs> so know? we can talk about it. Absolutely. But we've got quite a few interesting topics to take a look at today and a lot of positive stuff, a, a lot of general updates as well. Some, some new info has come to light in terms of Elon Musk's purchase of twitter and we can have a look at who are actually joining in to fund that purchase Uh uh-huh we're going to take a look at some new car companies that are going to be joining formula one whoa yeah hey susan susan are you listening because (laughs) we're going to talk about f1 bro formula one (laughs) and then we're also taking a look at some buys so soundcloud made a purchase for some new technology um, and that's quite interesting because SoundCloud's kind of disappearing, you know, into the into the abyss. Yeah, who still listens to SoundCloud? I'm well, all Spotify. I think it's like one of those things where more people listen on Spotify, but more people upload music on SoundCloud. Mm. You know what I mean? So I feel like there's mo- there's a lot of amateur music on SoundCloud, which m- is one of the main reasons why I don't listen to it. It's not that I don't like amateur music. It's just that it's not essentially what I'm looking for and, you know, my jog or at the gym or during work you know you kind of want what you like what do you listen to when you jog Kane? um really upbeat stuff you know is it rap or not um not just rap it's like my spotify soundcloud playlist of all my liked content will you share it with us yeah i want to see your playlist (laughs) because believe me i i look at playlists that i judge people yeah i guess you could tell a lot about a person by their playlist you know especially with uh, my music knowledge so i kind of know exactly how to sum the person up. But, <laughs> but with you, I'm thinking there will be a lot of rap. Because you like rapping as well anyway. Some rap. Always good, got <laughs> some acoustic guitar stuff in there as well. It's always good stuff. We're taking a look first at Starlink's new portability feature, which I think is actually really impressive because essentially internet has always been something that's either fixed to your home or accessible via your phone and that goes hand in hand with even an LTE connection because it's essentially the same thing it's just not through your phone it's through a LTE device and this draws a problem where if you go let's say camping outside of a cell reception area you got Mm -hmm. no internet and you can't go and say okay well I'm going to go camp for three days so let me get an ADSL line or a fiber line (laughs) installed quickly let me dig the the internet cafe (laughs) you know what I mean mean, let me just quickly set up an internet cafe so Starlink's new portability feature kind of brings the internet to people who are working remotely and traveling a lot going far going to places that don't necessarily have cell reception and cell coverage and I quite like it because in over the last few years I've moved quite a lot and it's always quite a hassle of you know okay let's get a new fixed internet installed right now the fixed internet is installed how much do I have to pay well why is this fixed internet so much slower and now you have to move again and you have to move again but you can't move now because you've got fiber no now I've got fiber so I'm locked in you know (laughs) at the ankle but uh, Starlink's internet from SpaceX service has gone mobile with a new portability feature for an additional monthly fee Starlink subscribers can now take their dishy anywhere on their home continent that provides active internet coverage that opens up connectivity to remote places that will likely never be covered by 5G. A potential boon to the increasing numbers of work from home anywhere types spawned from the COVID-19 
pandemic. SpaceX CEO Elon Musk responded to one happy Starlink customer on Twitter saying, Starlink is awesome for RVs, camping or any activity away from the city. And the comment that he responded to said, and it was by Dave Lee on the 3rd of May, it said, I'm camping at a remote state park this week with no cell reception. None of my hotspots work, um, such as Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile, which is the American mobile service providers. Yeah. Uh, so set up a Starlink and magic high-speed internet. Starlink is changing the game, and he tagged Elon Musk, and he shared a speed test. Right now, imagine you go into camping, you know, Northern Cape, Eastern Cape, wherever you go, you're camping. It's remote. There's not much civilization mm-hmm, around. Mm-hmm. You're disconnected from the world, and you go and you set up your Starlink internet satellite that you plug into your car, and you have a 145 megasecond internet connection wow 145 megas can i come visit you know what i mean like that's better than my father and this guy's camping out of an rv in the middle of nowhere and i think that is really really cool um and i think uh starlink doesn't uh doesn't necessarily support it using a 12v cigarette lighter but it does have a a way to to connect it to like a a bigger vehicle's battery you know what i mean okay have bigger batteries like an rv for example yeah yeah and then that's a way that they can set up that but I think it's a, it's a really good move from their side. It's definitely targeting a niche as well, solving but a big problem. You know that uh, Starlink, uh, SpaceX Starlink uh, satellite internet, uh, they also went to Ukraine to help out there with the war. Oh, yes, they right. made it free or they. So, yeah, they Elon like provided that. all the satellites there. They now have 150,000 daily users in Ukraine. <laughs> And that's like a lifeline for those people, hey? Yeah. That internet connection. So I think that's fantastic. And it it's is. free. It's free. It's free. 150,000 daily users was activated in uh, last or late March uh, by Elon Musk. He, no, he that's fantastic. City. Listen, we just uh, spoke about load shedding, Kane. Um, there's a suburb in uh, Johannesburg near Santon. It's yes. called uh, Linbro Park. Yes. Now, all these homeowners, it consists of 1,781 households, three offices, two schools, two, ter- two churches, uh, a hotel and a conference center. All these one people, neighborhood. Yeah. That's a, that's a suburb. Just one suburb. <laughs> yeah. It's like it's bigger than Eisner. <laughs> yeah, it's huge. But anyway, these people have had enough of the power cuts and load shedding, you know. Yeah. So they all got together. I think that's what we need to do is get together, get the money together, and now they want to get off the grid completely, take that whole suburb, all those houses and everybody, take them all off the grid. Good for them. So they are looking at options now to, they want to acquire an initial one megawatt of gas generation and then increase to 5.8 megawatts as developments in the area expand. So they want their own um, private power. Will so they one need megawatt to, be enough? No, I don't think that's going to be enough. I can't think that would be enough. Maybe they just want to start with sections and then uh, as they go along. that's, what, a thousand kilobytes? Yeah, but it's nice. A kilo... um, Ooh, I don't know. But I I think uh, it's a a big move because if you're tired of uh, what's happening right now, uh, instead of just doing it on your own, why don't you get together with with your entire neighborhood or suburb, have a a meeting, uh, 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 AGM or something, you know, get together in in some hall and then discuss it and uh, talk about the funding and the licensing and stuff. Have your own power. Have your own power. And you would, essentially, any neighborhood that does that gets a minimum of two and a half hours a day of more power than any other neighborhood. But Kane, also, let's be honest, these aren't poor people. No. This neighborhood is, is is a fancy one, so they can afford it. And good for them because we need people to... Because you can't... And I was explaining to a friend of mine the other day about commercialized products, right? If you look at your computer today, you would think that if you go out and you buy the best quality graphics card and processor and CPU and GP and all of these things, you go buy all of the components for your computer and now you believe, okay, I have the best computer in the world Mm. right there is no computer in the world that can be better than mine and there's no computer in the world that has uh, um, like um, uh, equipment that is to the level of mine but you're comparing your newly built pc in terms of its equipment on a commercial level because when you're creating technology the most important thing is 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 it's is its production scalable and most times something that performs really really better doesn't necessarily mean it's easily scalable 
right? It doesn't necessarily mean they can produce a million pieces of this technology cheaply, affordably, and hit mm. the market at the right price. So when you look at someone like a neighborhood like this going to set up a yeah. new renewable energy solution, you're basically putting the foot through the door in terms of what is scalable, you know what I mean? Identifying what technology solutions are scalable, and that will be the building blocks for which many neighborhoods in South Africa can get off the grid much more cheaply, you know, much more efficiently, and solve problems that they didn't first anticipate, right? So I n- we need neighborhoods to do things like this, who have the money and have the capital to take that risk, because essentially it's forming the foundation or the recipe for success for other neighborhoods to follow in their footsteps on a more commercialized level. Because right now, if you think about taking an entire neighborhood off the grid, that's not a necessarily scalable solution. That's mm. a very modular custom plan of action that has to be built up but the minute you can make that plan scalable and meet demand for different size neighborhoods and unique problems and and scenarios that's what we need right so i i I hope to follow the development of this neighborhood that's incredible so do you think we'll see more of it in the near future i think we will see more of it in the near near future as as i said you know they're, they're putting their foot through the door if it fails we know why and other people can make change. If it succeeds, we know why. And other people can succeed. It's a win-win. It's a win-win. Win-win Whether, for everyone. Exactly. Win-win for everyone. So let's take a look at, uh, before we cut to a music break, Starbucks is planning a global digital community around coffee with an NFT loyalty program. So hmm. we've seen a lot of industries now and a lot of big comp- corporate companies shifting over to NFTs. We've seen a lot of companies trying to integrate nfts we've seen some car companies try to integrate we've seen lamborghini come out with an nft collection we've even seen ubisoft coming out with some sort of nft integration now starbucks follows suit and they're planning to do what i like with nfts we always talk about nfts it's a picture it's a digital picture that's great what can i do with it nothing except look at it and show other people that i have it truly yeah Uh, that's a traditional nft and they have their own value and people really do appreciate them but nfts that have utility are what are really valuable. So Starbucks CEO Howard Schultz, along with Executive Vice President Chief Marketing Officer Brady Brewer, explained to investors during their Q2 2022 earnings presentation that the coffee company will add new concepts such as ownership and community-based membership models that will see developing in the Web3 space. Brewer went further saying, imagine acquiring a new digital collectible from Starbucks, where the product also serves as your access pass to global Starbucks community, one with engaging content experiences and collaboration all centered around coffee. They also went on to say that we plan to create a series of branded NFT collections, the ownership of which initiates community membership and allows for access to exclusive experiences and perks. The themes of these collections will be born of Starbucks artist expressions, both heritage and newly created, as well as through world-class collaborations with other innovators and like-minded brands. So what they're essentially saying is by going to Starbucks and shopping for your favorite coffee and joining into this program or winning something or being rewarded or being selected, essentially you receive a digital NFT. Yeah, And as long as you have ownership of that digital NFT, you get access to perks at Starbucks. Maybe every third coffee you get is free. Maybe you get to sit, sit in, a, in, in an exclusive seating arrangement that is mm. like the, the, the first class of Starbucks seating. Yeah. You know? Or you get access to a community forum on Starbucks where you can share information and express you know, opinions and things like that and, and communicate with a community of coffee goers. Um, as a person and then also as having an nft the more rare your nft the more you know you could get an even better seat you could get an even cooler badge on your profile within a forum when you're talking and things like that that's cool utility behind nfts Um, and it would make me want an nft like you hate nfts love nfts but give me a digital item that is exclusive to me that gives access to exclusive things for me as an individual when i go somewhere and i shop somewhere often like a loyalty program i'm down you know do whatever i'll I'll do it give me free coffee whatever you got to do to give me free coffee i'll take it you know what i mean (laughs) so that's what i think is really cool about starbucks's plan they're not just creating an nft of a coffee mug they're creating a community driven collection essentially that is accessible through the ownership of one of these nfts which is acquirable through some sort of thing that you do at starbucks or buy at starbucks or being a a frequent customer i think it's a really cool idea 
Very cool. Thank you, Kane. Uh, when we come back, we're going to talk about uh, some things that are shutting down this week. Uh, Facebook shutting down the podcast feature after just one year. And then I see YouTube uh, Go is also shutting down. I, ne- I didn't even know about YouTube Go, to be very honest. For me, YouTube Go <laughs> went. I don't know them. I've never used YouTube Go. Yeah, Savio. So it's disappearing. And then, oh, big news. WhatsApp is finally, and it's been confirmed today on Facebook itself by the man, Mark Zuckerberg, that WhatsApp is rolling out slowly but surely. They're starting right now, rolling out reactions to your to your messages. Okay. So you can actually react to the message. With a laugh face or a yeah. down thumb. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. you're going to start seeing that as from today. That's really cool feature. Uh, hopefully next week when we talk about it again, we can... You know, use it, test it it a bit, see if it works. Absolutely. Let's do it. (laughs) Off to the music break. Yeah, let's go for some music. Here's I Am. That's a very lacquer tune. It's C-R-M-N-L. Don't know if it's criminal, but it's called I Am. It's a good song. It's I like very it. nice, eh? It is a nice song. I liked how you you you, you transitioned you into it. the song there. Yeah, <laughs> I might keep that one. I've been doing this <laughs> for like over 10 years. I'm supposed to be able to do stuff like that now. But anyway, so Ken, you said uh, before the break, uh, you said you never used um, the lightweight version of YouTube called YouTube Go on your phone. I think once um, one of my phones was stolen, I ended up buying like a cheaper phone. Yeah, it's full for and then I used cheaper the phones. Go yeah, app. low-end smartphones they call yes. it. But it was first launched in 2016, and uh, now they're doing away with it. I wonder why. Is it because you can use YouTube Lite or something? So no, I think it's YouTube because Go? smartphones are getting more and more better like even the lowest end smartphones still perform so much better than the lowest end smartphones from a year ago or two years ago and youtube go probably came out five years ago you know what i mean okay so the minimum viable smartphone that you can pick up off the shelf today probably can handle youtube and youtube itself refining their code and their application have been able to get their their full app to run on lower devices so now you have the merge okay. of those so it's no two. longer it's probably just not necessary. even needed yeah and then why do you think why is facebook doing away with podcasts this week apparently they're just going to let it vanish they're not even going to inform people because there was a new podcast feature on your page that i actually quite liked because whenever we posted to tech plus it would actually show there as well and people could listen within the app within facebook yeah now they're doing away with it after just a year i think it's and especially what i think the key takeaway from that is that they're doing away with it silently without really telling anyone because obviously the usership statistics of that particular feature either doesn't promise the monetary revenue they initially expected they feel over competed against with the likes of spotify yeah you know or developmentally to take it to where they want it to go it's just going to cost too much money for not enough users so essentially you just say well no one's really using it we're not really going to put the money in to make it better we're not really interested in competing with spotify so and also remember with joe rogan with the joe rogan thing that happened everybody kept hearing spotify podcasts Joe Rogan podcast Spotify. So Spotify is the place. It's the podcasts. go-to place. Yeah. Yeah. It's been. Yeah. It's been. You know, imprinted on people's mind. Yeah. Why compete in that? In that exactly. Thing? So stay in your lane, Facebook. <laughs> or, or Meta, I should say. Just go into the, the, the <laughs> VR universe and but, go but, there. But talking about Facebook Meta, um, Zuckerberg confirmed today that um, they are rolling out reactions on um, on WhatsApp within the next uh, week or two. Starting today, well, you probably start noticing it later. They're also including the, you know, the hands that go together when you say thank you. Yes. They're including that as well. So if you want to say thank you to somebody, you can just react. To the hands. Yeah, you don't have to uh, actually type in a thank you. So that's nice. They're rolling it out. They've been doing it uh, since March for the Android beta testers. But now it's actually, they, they say it's ready to go. And the reactions will have like love laugh surprised sad and then as we uh, as we mentioned thanks <laughs> so <laughs> i feel like they could have rolled out with just reacting to a message with an emoji like yeah. let, let us be creative yeah let's form a message with pictures you know to, as our reaction i think i think it's great that you can react with an emoji i would love to see a reaction with a gif 
as well. It would be quite cool. Are you an admin on? Yeah, I, I like that, Kane. Are you an admin on a, a WhatsApp group? Yes. How many? Fifteen or so. <laughs> <laughs> no, really? Okay, well, then you will be pleased to know that WhatsApp will soon allow admins to delete any message for everyone in group chats. According to the report, if you are a group admin and want to delete a message for everyone in the group, an alert will appear. The notice will inform you that group participants can see who deleted the message. The update will also include an extended time frame during which you can delete messages for everyone. The deletion period uh, will be extended to two and a half days, two days and 12 hours. Is okay. that, how's that going to help you? Do you like that? Um, well, sometimes you po- you want to post something in one group and you post in the other and you want to remove it. But essentially, that functionality has always been available there. I think the mm. most that they did with that is extend the amount of time you have available to yeah. do that. Okay. Um, I don't really agree with being able to delete messages. It is a life. It's a lifesaver in some scenarios. <laughs> Ooh, but at yes. the same time, you know, if someone life. says something... You know, there's a deadline being created. It's a corporate and uh, corporate chat. You know, there's employees yeah. and employers all in the same chat. An employee says, "Hey, I did. Uh, I'm going to have this done by such and such a date. Such and such a date comes. Message is deleted. Oh. He said, she said, happens. You know. So I think it's. I would be happy if I can toggle that feature on and off depending on the group. And I've got on one word purpose. to say to you, Kane. What? Screenshot. Screenshot. I have I have like thirteen thousand photos of my phone. If I can find a screen, you know what it is to, to to sift through screenshots. I know, but they listen, all look the same. I'm, yeah, but I made a, a folder with my screenshots. It kind of helped. <laughs> now at least you've got the general photos out of the way. <laughs> so are you are you ready for what's next? Yes. Okay. So Shoprite. We all know Shoprite. They're taking a big leap here. I mean, I, I think they're definitely trying. And it's funny because when I associate, when I think of Shoprite, I think of the lower tier shopping center. Yeah. You know, then I think pick and pay. Yeah. Kind of above Shoprite. Then yeah. I think Spa yeah. above pick and pay, and then Woolworths above Spa. <laughs> I was going to ask you, where's Willie's? On you the- know, <laughs> like then it's just yeah. that's just. But I would think Woolworths would come to the table with something like this yeah. first but it's interesting to see ShopRite doing it and, and it's actually quite interesting because keep an eye on ShopRite doing things like this and enabling things like this is what makes companies grow fast mm-hmm. you know get known around everywhere Yeah. so ShopRite is launching a store run by AI here's how it will work have wow. you ever imagined a store where you can walk in grab something and just leave if you have you're either really invested in the future of shopping in South Africa or you're a thief I'm gonna- <laughs> I was going to say yes. You're a shoplifter. <laughs> that was a, that was a statement made oh, by um, an article on stuff.co.za, <laughs> and I thought I have to include that. That That's was really funny. Yeah. Um, so Shoprite has also been thinking about the future of shopping and has begun using AI and machine learning in their stores. The idea behind it is simple. Shoprite wants to help solve the ever-growing problem of food waste. And I think actually Shoprite and Checkers are very closely related. Yeah, it's I not think the Checkers same is owned by Shoprite. Yeah, same company. Interesting. Yeah. Um, because I remember a Shoprite, like a dedicated Shoprite. Just the Shoprite, store. yeah, mm. with the with the red and yellow logo. Yes. I remember it. And then then it was called Shoprite Checkers. Yes. And now it's just called Checkers. I think it's just called Checkers. And che- oh, I don't know. What so happened. when people think of AI and machine learning, they often imagine scenarios where robots take over. Fortunately, Shoprite's AI is a little less complicated. At the end of 2021, Shoprite began testing a concept store which would be fully automated, no queues, no checkout, no waiting. ShopRite Group has created a new business unit called ShopRite X. This is responsible for the creation of the Checkers 6060 app and the Extra Savings Rewards program. The unit is now heading the creation of Checkers Rush, the automated cashless store which can be found in Brackenfall, Cape Town. Um, the next era of growth for us is about precision retailing. Shop e- ShopRite X will use our rich customer data to supercharge a smarter ShopRite and ultimately fuse the best of our digital with our operational strength across the continent, said the ShopRite CEO, Peter Engelbrecht, in 2021. That's my uncle. <laughs> I was about to say, your brother's <laughs> with you. Yeah, you know what I mean? Um, how it works. Here's how things will go down. Any customer that wishes to shop from Checkers Rush will require the free Checkers Rush app to be installed on their phone. When entering the store, 
store, customers will need to scan the QR code generated in the app before being able to use the store. Customers will need to load their relevant bank cards onto the app so the store can make the necessary deductions. Once inside, customers won't have to do much more than choose the items they want and leave. A few minutes later, a receipt will be sent directly to the customer's phone. It's as easy as it sounds. So how does the store know what you're paying for? Yeah, yeah. And this is the AI part. Yeah. So inside the store is a series of cameras which are placed in the ceiling, silently watching every product. The cameras are paired up with AI algorithms which are designed to track customers' movements and can see exactly which items get into a customer's basket. Wow. The AI has to be trained first. That's how AI works. You feed yeah. it information, it learns, and mm. then it can act on that That's new knowledge. That's right. Yeah. So it ha- the AI has to be trained first before it can happen. And since the store opened, employees have been test driving it as often as possible, giving the AI algorithm information to learn from. As time goes on, the system will get better at that. And eventually, when enough time has passed, they hope that the cameras will be able to accurately identify the items taken off of the shelves 100% of the time. There must be some some glitches, I'm sure. I'm sure there is going to be yeah. many glitches. And a teasing problems. So yeah, so and I can't imagine going into a store and, and taking a carton of milk and getting charged for 10 bags of briquettes. You know exactly. what I mean? <laughs> like... Uh, that is going to happen. It's you know, inevitable. Yeah. So it'll take an t- amount of time for the AI to really get that rolling. But they're not short of data to feed it with. Yeah. So the AI was granted access to ShopRite's customer demographic, which ShopRite pulls from the Extra Savings Rewards program. The information adds up to about a petabyte or a thousand terabytes worth of data, Yo. which shows what product certain customers buy more often and when customers like to do their shopping. The system can then automatically place extra orders for busier months or for when products are most likely to be bought. For example, the system could order larger shipments of chocolates in time for Easter. This system will help the stores avoid excess food waste and keep track of the more popular items. Fully automated shop uh, 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 super ret. Have you ever thought... I've wanted that all the time. I go into um, I go into a shopping center or like spa, you know, and I'm like, okay, what do I need? One thing, some chicken. Okay, great. Now I go wait in this 30 person strong queue. Yep. With each person having 30 items at least, you know, <laughs> and you're like, okay, well, can I go to the 10 items at once? No, there's already 25 people with at least five items queued up there. To be able to just walk out the store, just cheers, goodbye, I'm out. You get charged my phone, it's accurate, and it's hope it's 100% accurate, and you're on your way. It's going to make shopping a lot more enjoyable for me. I Definitely, think. yeah. And there must be a, like a, an option to log a fault, you know, or log a complaint or dispute if they charge you wrong. Yeah. Whatever. But it's almost like shopping, but the Big Brother version. Big Brother shopping. <laughs> yeah, Big Brother shopping. Yeah. No, absolutely. So now let's take a look at... Um, Let's take a look at something that I find quite interesting. Elon Musk's new 111 billion uh, f- rand worth of funding for the Twitter purchase, and and how is that happening, and where is it coming from? So Elon Musk has secured about 7.1 billion dollars, or 111 billion rand, of new financing commitments for his proposed 44 billion dollar takeover of Twitter Inc., which is about 700 billion rand. Um, The company said in a filing on Thursday, the commitment comes as Tesla Inc. billionaire marshals capital to bankroll one of the largest tech industry acquisitions to date. The investors named in the filing include Binance, that's a cryptocurrency exchange, the the biggest in the world, um, Brookfield, Fidelity Management and Research, Lawrence, Ellison Revocable Trust and Qatar Holding. Twitter shares rose 2.3% in pre-market trading. Musk is now in discussions with Twitter co-founder Jack Dorsey on contributing some of his shares towards the acquisition. And this is what I found quite interesting. And I was speaking to a friend of mine about it earlier today, actually. You know, Elon Musk comes along and purchases Twitter for $44 billion, like in a massive amount of money. Usually when you hear about these tech purchases, it's like, Activision buys Blizzard. You know what I mean? Mm, mm. It's like big company buys smaller company. Yeah. Or big company and big company combine. Yes. You know, and partner. This is like 
human being buys a big company. <laughs> yeah, it's you know probably, what I mean? Like uh, one it's person. It's probably a first in, in, in human history, eh? <laughs> it's yeah, it's unreal. true. Wow, that is uh, unreal. So the company also said that a previously announced margin loan committed towards the deal was reduced to an aggregated principle of $6.25 billion instead of $12.5 billion. The world's richest man reached an agreement on April 25 to acquire Twitter using a financing plan that's alarmed some Tesla investors. In addition to pledging tens of billions of dollars worth of his Tesla shares to support margin loans, Musk has vowed to line up some $21 billion worth of equity. It's unclear how much of that would come from selling a portion of his Tesla stake. However, Musk has already sold more than $8.5 billion or 133 billion rand of Tesla stock to finance the deal. Of course he did, man. Man. Of course he did. Imagine being Elon like, you know, I like the social media platform. You know, I'm just going to sell... I'm going to sell some stuff there at the second-hand store, and you know what? I'm just going to go buy it. It's not, it's not a Yo. big thing for me, you know? Yo. I'm just trying to get into that frame of mind, and it just it just blows my mind. No, it's, there's, it. there's, there's so many, you know, so it's so complex, the life that they're leading right now, yeah. compared to what we have to, you know, the, you think for one second his, his mortgage comes to mind oh. you know, when he's considering this buyout. He can fund like 30 house purchases with one fifth of that money exactly you know so it's like a ridiculous amount of money yo, yo, so yo, yo. before we go over to the next music break i was so excited when i read this audi and porsche are set to join formula one susan right susan are you listening say hello to susan hi susan <laughs> <laughs> so oh that's if funny. audi and porsche are set to join formula one what does that mean well formula one is like the best way to market a car manufacturer in the world you yeah, know, for for high value production, top quality cars. Yeah, who are you going to listen to? You're going to go buy an AMG, you know, from the Formula One Grand Prix versus something that's not on the Formula One Grand yeah. Prix. If you want a sports car, if you're like really, you know, it's such a great advertising model. If these, if Ferrari is one of the best performing Formula One cars, obviously Ferrari's new car is going to perform well. Yeah, that's the logic. So it's a very good marketing platform. Um, so now it's finally official that VW will be joining um, F1. Volkswagen Group CEO Herbert Dies revealed that Audi and Porsche would join Formula One in 2026. Um, he shared the news in a live stream titled Dialogue with Dies on an official Volkswagen Group page on YouTube. According to him, regulation changes announced for the sport last month will allow sufficient time for both Porsche and Audi to begin development. In other words, 2026 is the perfect opportunity for them to enter Formula One. And, but why is it a game changer? So regulation changes will permit Porsche and Audi to get involved at a competitive level. Soon, all competitors will be required to power their Formula One cars using synthetic fuel. It's what um, Dees calls a technology window. He also went on to say in the live stream that the full development of such an engine would take three to four years. Enough time for Volkswagen Group to create their own version. We assume that in 2026 or 2028, it will still be the biggest motorsport spectacle in the world, even more so than today. More in China, more in the USA, than today and this is also the largest marketing platform for these um, premium vehicles so i'm looking forward to seeing what happens it's always fun i love i love watching f1 i think it's a lot of fun i think it's the pinnacle of you know um, vehicle manufacturing essentially for yeah how fast can we go how fast can we take a corner shame uh, but i just really hope for lewis hamilton's sake that they sort out his car because he's been having really big problems uh, yeah so this weekend hopefully uh his car will perform better because i don't know if you if you watch but lewis i mean we're used to lewis being a champion number one and he's been way behind uh, with his car because it's just not working it must well. be so frustrating and his car's ho- they call it pur- porpoising Porpoising, his car's hopping. Hopping, yeah. hopping. Yeah, it's like hopping above the ground. Yeah, Bad it's, air something's stream. not working there. Yeah. Interesting. They're trying to figure it out. Apparently, they got new parts now, so hopefully, that's gonna work. Well, they you could definitely say that F1 cars have some of the best, you know, technology in there for, for motorsport eh? racing. You Absolutely, know what I mean? just the st- just the technology that they use during the broadcast, where they can show you how fast the person is going and all that kind of stuff. On your screen, isn't it fantastic? No, it's really All those cool. sensors and things uh, around, uh, you know. No, no, it, it. it's really, really cool. So are we heading into a music break now? We sure are. And then when we come back, okay, don't you hate it 
when you go onto Netflix and you look for a show and it's no longer there because they lost the licensing deal. <laughs> <laughs> that happened with Modern Family. Yes. Um, there were a few, a few actually times where I was like looking around and it and was New Girl as well, I think. Yeah, and just uh, then you realize, hey, it's the 1st of May, their contract must have expired. Yeah, and surely if I started paying for my subscription when they had their license, I should still be allowed to exactly. watch it, seeing that I... Because then know? it goes to it usually goes to a rival streamer. So yeah. they're like, hey, okay, now we're carrying the show for the next six months. Yes. You've had your turn. But it's not good for the subscribers because we don't... We're not all subscribed to the same thing. No. So that is a problem. You've got to kind of keep the content on there. Yeah, exactly. All, for all time, you know. Exactly. It's like going to V's video, but sometimes they have the videos. Like you, you, yeah. you watch like season one, season two, season three of a series, and then you go there. And they're like, no, you know, we're not ready. We, we kind of just threw those DVDs away. Yeah. You know, what remember are you that. Do? <laughs> Jeez, man, listen, I, I, I don't know. That was probably before your time. I remember going to a video shop. Was it Mister Video? I think. Yes. And I then you, that. and then you get there and. Um, uh, you you get the tape and then the person who had the like the tape not the DVD yet it was the cassette not cassette the videotape yeah and you get uh, you get to your house and you put it in the video machine and then you realize that the person didn't rewind it <laughs> and you got to rewind and your video machine's very slow now you have to rewind it it takes a lot of time <laughs> and then the worst of all is just the tapes all worn out and then your video machine starts eating the tape I oh, know yeah <laughs> remember that then oh that was, that was horrible ago, man eh? that was horrible that was not optimal uh, I can't I can't believe I lived through it <laughs> as a nineties kid. Now I feel so old. Well, oh my gosh, it is my birthday next Thursday. Really, eh? So what we're going to be, be doing? We're going to be on air. Then. We're going to be on air on your birthday. <laughs> it's like Tech Plus the birthday special. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, cool. So we're going to talk about Netflix losing some of its uh, licensed dead shows to streaming rivals and also Disney Plus coming to South Africa soon. And then Web Africa. Uh, an ISP they closed their offices completely oh they are now 100% working remotely really remotely are yeah. no physical no office, office at all what is it is it a good move we're going to talk about that I want your it. I want your take on it here's Callum Scott Callum Scott with Rise, the Sam Felt uh, remix. Uh, if you just joined us here on Tech Plus, a very big hello to you and welcome. Also, a very big hello to Edmund. Edmund is listening. He just sent us uh, a WhatsApp message, Kane, and he is a massive F1 fan. So he, he sent me the Red Bull logo. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Really, yeah, he's a, he's a massive F1 fan, eh? Good to have you on, man. Yes, yes. It's nice to have you with us, uh, Edmund. So just before uh, a Callum Scott song, we spoke about uh, Netflix, and uh, it looks like it's happening in the United States at the moment. They're losing massive, massive shows. I think one of them is actually Friends. Oh, I mean, my word. <laughs> so How do you lose Friends? Friends could be pulled when current contracts expire, and then obviously uh, we've got uh, shows picking them up. Uh, or I mean rivals picking them up so you know you've got so many streaming services nowadays not just in South Africa you've got HBO Max uh, there's one called Peacock did you, did you know no. about that one we don't have it here in South Africa and then the other one is uh, Disney Plus it's launching right now yes right here in South now. Africa right now uh, oh wait the 18th of May so and close yet so far 119 rand per month or you can pay uh, 950 rand for the entire year, so you save uh, some money there. Uh, but you must register if you want to go for that early sign-up offer. You must register on DisneyPlus.com. It's called the Early Bird Specials. I uh, think, uh, don't you think Netflix is a bit worried? You know, yeah, they must be because so they're already they're already suffering a loss. Yeah. Look at all the subscribers they lost and and all that kind of stuff that's happening now. But hopefully Ozark. Gave them a boost. Yeah. <laughs> How did uh, you watched Ozark this weekend, didn't you? The newest, last the newest week, yes. episodes. Yeah, the last, the final, final episode. Before you say anything about it, because it's the final episodes of the L- entire show, forever and ever. Rate the show out of ten. The entire show. The entire show out of ten, and then the latest, because it's the cl- it's the final season. So that must be like a twelve out of ten. You know what yeah. I mean? But rate the show the and then show. the final season. Okay, I'll rate the, f- the entire show. I'll give it 
nine nine out of ten. Okay. Because ten out of ten is just too biased. <laughs> and then uh, the latest season, the season finale, uh, guys, I won't give spoilers, don't worry. But um, you know when you watch a season finale, it's supposed to kind of punch you in the gut. Yeah. That's uh, like when the credits roll for the final time with the final season, you need to sit there and... Be so shocked, <laughs> like you go into a coma for days, and then you, you ponder your existence. And, uh, and all the kind of stuff. For me, the final, there, there was one scene in the final that uh, it was the death of, of a character that really got to me. I, I didn't think they would actually kill off the character no. because uh, the, that twist. character is is a big big character in the show. But the final scene, it just didn't punch me. It, really? it, it left me confused actually so I had to go up online and join Reddit <laughs> Reddit, <laughs> Reddit threads and all that kind of stuff to make sense of it and now it makes sense but I would have to be very very honest I would have done it differently yeah. uh, the final scene the, yeah it's it's not a happy ending but it's also not really a sad ending it's almost like an open ending you kind of you can jump to your own conclusion. I don't know if they're leaving the ending open for a sequel one day. I don't know. Maybe. They could but, definitely. Uh, it didn't punch me. Yeah. It didn't leave me gasping, you know, like a season finale is supposed to do. Yeah. So would it have scored lower than your overall rating? Absolutely. Yeah. Really? For the final season, I will give it... <sighs> it's a tough, tough one. I'll give it seven. Seven? Yeah. Not bad. It's above six. It's all right. Yeah. And below eight. Yeah. So I would have. I would have done it differently because they've got brilliant writers on there. So I don't know why they ended it the way they did. Yeah. Uh, maybe they wanted to keep everybody happy. I don't know. I think the problem with the season finale is you're essentially ending that show's lifespan. So why would new customers come to Netflix for a fun finale? I feel like cancelling my Netflix now because. <laughs> <laughs> Because we've, we've discovered the problem. It's listen, Ozark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Kane, all my sh- favorite shows ended now. I watched the Grace and Frankie finale as well. That's yeah, finished now as is. well. Um, there was another one I watched that's also finished now. Uh, now I can't get to the name. But basically, all my shows ended now. Dance so now you. I'm just there. Now. I don't want to watch new stuff. I don't feel like it. I think it's a big problem. And that's where it's uh, circling back to the initial question. You know, I think Netflix feels under a lot of pressure. Like everybody is literally salivating for their viewership. Yeah. They made a massive success. They had it perfectly timed for the pandemic. Everyone kind of woke up. And now we see the, the, the result of waking up and realizing we got to do something and that action to actually do it. Now we see it. We see Disney Plus. We see all these places Oof. expanding and it's a lot attempting. Of pressure. And now you've got Netflix that had the opportunity for the last two years to produce enough content. So they had a content shortfall. They're losing subscribers. <laughs> and the shows are getting, some of the shows are getting bad reviews. So ultimately what's happening is why would a person who has the, the rights to a season of a show or a series or a movie, why are they going to pick Netflix? They have diminishing subscriber count. They have this, 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 and this. You know what I mean? It, it's it's like a it's like a snowball effect where now they're losing licenses. So people are pulling out the renewal on certain licenses. Yeah, they're like, yeah. either you pay us more, or we're pulling it out and going to competitors because the competitors are like, sure, we'd love we, to have friends. Yeah, we need friends. Yeah. We need Modern Family. We exactly. need all of these. Yeah. Let's get the good shows. Mm-hmm. Let's get the staple shows. Yeah. And that Netflix is like we're losing our staple shows. Now there's Netflix originals. Just the originals, yeah. That are late on delivery. (laughs) Yeah. You have Amazon, which is making somewhat of an attempt. Disney Plus, which is a massive organization. And you're left in the scenario where, like, I'm watching certain shows that I have to go on VPN to watch because Mm -hmm. they're just not available in my country. In South Africa, yeah. And that's a big problem. I hate when that happens. No, it's a massive problem. And, like, when you're watching a show on Netflix and you're like, okay, it goes to season three. That's the end of the show, and your friend says, "You know, I've watched the whole of season four. And you're like, "What do you mean? It doesn't yeah, exist? No, it's it just does." In our country, yeah, that's like two sucks years so ago bad. it came out. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like the Good Doctor. The Good Doctor came oh, out. Oh yeah, Netflix. that's right. Yes, I watched a lot of it. Got to the end, and I was like, "Okay, well, I guess we have to wait another year." And then I realized there's two more seasons, but we're not seeing it off yet. Netflix. You know, um, and that's a big problem. It's like those staple shows are, are are a necessity. Could they be heading for an iceberg like DSTV? Well, the thing is, <laughs> DSTV doesn't have as big of a problem they have a big problem but netflix has a bigger problem because other competitors see the the loss of subscribers the the license pullouts and they see weakness Uh and you have to capitalize on that weakness yeah so everybody's trying to squeeze in here during netflix's stumble 
Um, and DSTV is just like the shrapnel on the side, you know, just big, big, big corpse collide. And you've got DSTV <laughs> there like, we know, don't know what, what we do. What are we going to do? <laughs> we can put some of these Oaks apps on our decoder, uh, you know. And it's, it's a, that must be a horrible position to be in because it, in the end you're redundant, but you kind of, you have to think out of the box to survive. Yeah, when you have Apple TV and you have it's Amazon or Prime and you have Disney Plus, playing this game of tug of war for content licensing and you have someone like dstv like can we put in a bit too <laughs> you know how are you gonna get content licensing it's very sad you content? know because dstv used to be the rolls royce of television it really in South did Africa. you know you know especially in the early 90s it was a massive luxury to have but then you look at someone like well, netflix who, who originally did those stamp things you know where they send you the video, actual dvds the yeah, actual dvds yeah. you you have you they evolved they they saw that the market was shifting yeah look at them now yeah dstv i felt like sat back a bit and said we're fine you know yeah. we have all these paying subscribers We've, everybody's gonna keep uh, our yeah. subscriptions because they need it for the sport and then people got clever now they're watching the sport elsewhere well you can go and watch DSTV the sport for free on like a sports betting site like if you just go yeah. find a sports betting site you can watch live sport we free. once we once tried doing that i think it was during the world UFC, cup or something uh, or i don't know it was you yeah some kind of world cup uh rugby world cup and at that stage no access to dstv and it was so bad i don't know who sponsored <laughs> that stream or what but it, it kept breaking up in blocks and then the image would reverse and then, and then all the players would go yellow and it was just terrible just terrible so here is another piece of news that i thought you know yes this deserves to get spoken about so um tiktok has now started the idea of sharing some of their ad revenue with their creators and this is That's always nice. an important phase because when you look at something like youtube and I am the testament to it. You can make a living off of YouTube. You know, that's you, yeah. Before I started doing, Brocaine. you know, so before I started doing international marketing and stuff, I ran a YouTube channel, and it made that's me right. enough money to survive. And yeah. that's on ad revenue sharing. Yes. It was seventy five percent, twenty five percent at the time. It's now moved to fifty five percent. How did they pay you? Was it PayPal? You got paid via bank, bank transfer. Wow. I got paid from Google Ireland. But those were the goods. YouTube days. It's it's more difficult nowadays. It's right? more difficult, but viewing the the it's a numbers game. You have the views, you you get the money. You know, you have high quality views, you get more money. But again, um, how how would you do that? Because it's so competitive. People are already doing every single thing you can think of. How unique do you have to be with your content to rise above and not drown in 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 that mix of of people? I think it is. It's a long term. It's gone from a short term game to a long term game, whereby you're producing a type of content that other people also produce, but people prefer the way that you present your content. Oh yes, yes. Okay. And those yeah, people yeah. find you and say, "Hey, you're actually better than what I have yeah. been watching." It's I like prefer they like your, your, your personality, you know, more. or they they they're looking for something, or they're watching something, they watch it, and then they're looking for something else that's similar, and they see, "Oh, this guy also made a video about that." Like, and that's how you start gaining subscribers. Or you're so more well spoken or better looking. Yeah, present the best. <laughs> target a niche yeah. and stay consistent it will work is that your advice to yeah. a new youtuber yeah, well? yeah absolutely even start existing youtubers you know pick a niche stay consistent to that niche and produce content that you feel will be um, um, digested well from your audience give something new you know don't just try and do don't you see a youtuber doing something you say hey that's pretty cool you know i'll just make a video like that there's lots of people that will watch maybe they haven't watched it no like recreate the wheel a little bit bring in some some kind of um originality you know and and have it be a passionate originality like be passionate about this originality you're bringing to the table stay consistent and target a niche flip you might like five different niches don't keep them on one channel have five different channels for one for each niche and build yourself up oh like yeah that. you can make more more than one build channel. yourself up like that yeah for any for but now obviously we're talking about tiktok so tiktok has has is opening up a way for co uh, for content creators to make more money the company plans to start sharing a cut of revenue with top creators when their videos mm -hmm. run alongside certain ads the program mirrors how youtube pays out creators and it would lead to more significant payouts from the platform which has yet to offer a substantial way for content creators to make money which is the dividing factor between tiktok and youtube someone on tiktok might not be making as much ad revenue as someone on youtube 
YouTube. Um, they could be making considerably less, but you know, privatized sponsorships and deals, that's kind of where money can come from, from TikTok as well, outside of ad revenue sharing. The new program called TikTok Pulse allows ads to be uh, specifically run alongside the top 4% of all videos on TikTok only. Um, the company wrote in a blog post today, creators and publishers with at least 100,000 followers are eligible to receive a cut of revenue when their videos are included. TikTok will share 50% of ad revenue from Pulse with approved creators. Sandy Hawkins, TikTok's GM of North America Global Business Solutions, told The Verge that's how close to what YouTube offers cr uh, creators, giving them a reported 55% cut from ads. Hawkins says that TikTok's Pulse will launch in June in the US with additional markets coming sometime in the fall. Until now, TikTok's main way of compensating creators has been through its creator fund, which pays out select users based on the popularity of their videos. But creators have said the payouts from this program can be small and inconsistent, which means it hasn't offered creators a sustainable revenue stream the way that YouTube ad programs have for some video makers. And that's essentially the step that TikTok needs to make for that retention of their content creators. You wanna, it's great to get views, but you need to be able to make money. The more money a content creator can make on your platform, yeah. the more revenue streams he can establish with private sponsorship deals, um, long-term sponsorship deals, exclusive ad revenue commission, and all that sort of stuff. The more attractive they can make it, the more fair and equal they can make it, and the more that they can give in terms of direct monetary revenue to their creators, the more creators are going to be present on your platform, the more focused creators are going to put into your platform, and essentially the greater your um, your market share will become. You know, it's like proportionate. So you have to give a lot to get a little, um, but yeah. getting giving a lot to a little bit of people, um, a lot of people come seeking out that as well, and that's how you grow. So that's TikTok's new um, ad revenue streaming strategy. And then on the other side, we're talking about TikTok as a business paying out people that use the platform. Elon Musk has suggested on Twitter that governments and corporations should pay a slight cost to use Twitter. So on the one side, you've got TikTok who wants to pay people for um, creating content. And then Elon Musk wants to charge people who aren't traditional normal users who are corporates or um, governments to be charged for using Twitter to maintain a Twitter profile. And um, mm. Elon Musk's acquisition of Twitter hasn't been finalized yet, but the world's richest man is keeping busy by kicking around ideas for potential changes to the platform. His latest suggestion is these this, uh, charging corporations and governments to tweet. Ultimately, the downfall of the Freemasons was giving away their stone-cutting services for nothing, tweeted Musk. Twitter will always be free for casual users, but maybe a slight cost for commercial state government users. And as is often the case with Musk, there's no commitment to this plan this guy's just tweeting you know what i mean yeah just he likes tweeting. to yeah um, but it does fit in with what we previously heard about musk's ideas for the platform root has reported last month that when pitching banks on his acquisition um musk suggested he might charge media companies to quote or embed tweets in each case the logic is simple twitter is currently free people want the product so why not charge for it um, that's a very good point, but it is a little bit more challenging because if you start charging government and big corporations to use Twitter, you don't want like a local brewery to pay the same amount as Coca-Cola to mm. use Twitter. And in the same way, how do you determine a local brewery is that size and a Coca-Cola company is yeah. this size? Do you weigh, would you weigh it on, on follower count, which might not be directly proportionate to business revenue? So a business with a low amount of followers might make more revenue than a business with a lot of followers. So it's a very difficult thing to implement. But ultimately, we're talking about Musk here. This idea might disappear, never come back. Yeah. Or it might come back with some solution that's like, you know, the Starlink of charging <coughs> governments and yeah. corporations to use Twitter. And uh, ultimately, I think it's a good idea because, you know, they must maintain revenue. Ad revenue comes from ads, you know. And if you can subsidize revenue, you have less ads. And on something right. like Twitter, why have more ads? You know, if you can sustainably turn revenue with less ads, the, view, the user experience is better. You're charging people that can afford it. 
and ultimately you know you're left in a position where everyone can use it for free except for people that are trying to make money or other people that are using it for free it's a good system difficult to implement facebook wants to charge us for ads anyway facebook yeah. is like or they you, won't show it to anybody facebook is like if you want to have a page on facebook you must pay for everything yeah you know what i mean Not that's like a how it's bit, going like everything. yeah it's total greed, I tell you. I'm not happy. <laughs> hey, listen, before we, we're running out of time, but uh, just quickly, uh, I just wanted to also mention to you, uh, the ISP Web Africa closed its uh, Cape Town office recently on the 30th of April. They switched to a complete remote working model, and they're going to see how that is going now in Cape Town. But I see their Joburg office will still uh, remain open until February 2023. So, obviously, they saw how it was going during lockdown with everybody working from home. And the overwhelming consensus of the staff was that they found working from home offered far more benefits than uh, returning to the office. Also, there's the rising petrol costs uh, where remote working drastically reduces the burden of these increases on uh, staff's uh, pockets. But Web Africa, an ISP, found that employee productivity actually increased by 20 percent and employee happiness which is measured quarterly is also at an all-time high since their staff started working fully remote how do you feel about a fully remote option uh you know it depends on what industry you're in i suppose uh this now being an isp in the tech world so it's much easier than saying uh, running a supermarket which you can't run from home well i must say uh, you know three four months ago i would have said to you you know remote work is the way to go and yeah it, it really is the the like the godsend of employee happiness essentially you're giving them the freedom that they never had they don't have to travel they don't have to spend money on ex- travel expenditure you know some people get subsidized for that but either way, it, sh- it shouldn't be, you know, it shouldn't be a prerequisite. But at the same time, for the employees, it's, it's great. For the managers of the employees, it's actually where the difficulty comes in. That's because right. Yeah. You don't have them in front of you. You have to get on a call with them. They have the ability to, you know, hide under the covers, you know, not be available. Uh, but at the same time, they have the freedom to work deep into the evening. They don't, That's their, right. Their midnight oil burning doesn't mean being in the office at 11 p.m. Yeah, exactly. You know? Uh, you can have more freedom in your day. So there's a, a good side and a bad side to it. But ultimately, it comes down to the management of the company that determines how that con- how that translates to the end user and their experience of this business and their and their te- and their actual actual um, being serviced by this business. You know, the, if if employee happiness is up and empl- and employee management is really rock solid, everyone's happy. Work's getting done more. And, you know, everything works. But we recently had an employee that left and they said, you know, we're, we don't like working remote. I would prefer to walk and work in a more corporate environment mm. where I can go into an office. Because you're I more thought, disciplined. Uh-huh. And you can you're go, more yeah. disciplined. Yeah, and you're with colleagues and there, yeah, there's a benefit like human, there. Human interaction is also exactly. very important. So mixed feelings about it, right? Mixed feelings. You're, you're essentially taking away what is one of the benef- biggest benefits of, of, a cor- of, a, of a corporate environment where everybody is together and collaborating, yeah, which is working the as ability to take people with a very low skill or a very low level of experience and actually help them hands-on. To, to gain the knowledge and the experience that they need in order to operate on a top level. If all your employees are top level and they exactly know what's going on and everything's good and there's no learning curve, everything will run smooth. You know what I mean? So the growth aspect, scalability also revolves because you're kind of bringing, so- you're bringing someone into your business over a phone call, essentially. Yeah, you know you're I mean? right. You're trying to so explain the It's a tough not. one, eh? It's but tough. also, I'm just thinking, how much are they saving on rent, you know? Because obviously, they were renting a massive office. Now, they don't have to pay that. So that's great. No, they're saving huge money. Yeah. The employees are happy. As I said, it literally So it's working down. for them. Exactly. For Web Africa, Cape Town, it's working. The people that might not work for is literally the people that have to manage the employees. Because all the work can yeah, be done, right. but it has to be strict. Yeah. It has to be coordinated. Unless you like a, a company overseas, they kept cameras on their staff. Like front cams on their uh, thing so they could watch there, you all day. There are, if, there are definitely some um, miscellaneous methods to do. Like I've seen ones that even a friend of mine was working remotely. Every... 35 seconds his mm-hmm. PC takes a screenshot and sends it over to see what is <laughs> to see what's on his page wow his okay laptop. wow that's really cool and then you mentioned oh. the one with the camera yeah and those are very intrusive 
It is it's about actually. building trust between yeah. you and your employees. Yeah. It's about having that trust and that res- and that level of responsibility from them and from you to maintain that long distance relationship and actually collaborate together as a team. It's a challenge, but if it works, it works really, really, really well. well so far, it's working for Web Africa. So Let's I don't see what see happens. Why I can't work for anybody else. Yeah. But uh, yeah, they must save a lot of money on rent, I tell you. <laughs> and then, uh, gosh, we almost forgot about it, but today is World Password Day. So today, make a point of it to change any easy passwords. Uh, hopefully, you'll remember it. Very important to change your password. So if your <laughs> Don't password, change your password and forget, though. <laughs> but, okay, so what must I do if my password is 1234? Um, I mean, even not at my at password at is a better password than one, two, three, four. Yeah, yeah. you're right. Mm. So they say try not to use pet names or family names, important dates or other identifying information. For God's sakes, also don't if use you, your cell phone number or your ID number. Yeah, don't use your cell phone number. Don't use your ID number. Don't use too much identifying information. And if you do happen to use identifying information, separate that information with special characters. And if a, if, if a Russian scammer online asks you what was your first pet's name that's already a red flag (laughs) he's trying to hack you yeah but if you had like three family members that you really care about you could put the one's name and then an at sign and the other's name and then an exclamation mark and the other's name and a hashtag and that is very secure the problem is how do you remember it Huh? How do you remember it? Well, that's the beauty of using public, you know, like using something that is close to you, but separating it with some sort of character that's special because you know that it's... But we still big. forget it, Kane. So I, I've, it. Got a no- <laughs> I've got a notepad on my phone that's password protected with my passwords inside the notepad. But what if I forget my notepad's password? <laughs> you see, it's complicated. That's why we all go for the easy things because we know we'll remember it. Yeah. But that's... A vulnerability and that's how they hack you man yeah it is like that i mean microsoft a few months ago introduced no password so to log into your microsoft account you need no password you just enter in your email address and confirm the link in your email but if your password is password or one two three four whatever you should do something about it today on world password day well if you're really considering changing your password go to a, a place that shows everybody who like all the leaked password information i can't have a um have I been pawned? I think is is one of the oh, really? one of the websites. And you go and you enter your email address, mm-hmm. and it'll tell you which um, breaches, data breaches that email address was included with. Wow! Which will tell you, like, hey, you had a password to Adobe Cloud Suite um, for this email address, and if you know you still use that password, you best change it because it's available. I can go and download that information, find your email address and find the password that was used for that leak. It's available online. So just going to a site like that and saying, you know, entering in your various email addresses and seeing if you've been breached anywhere, then you know whether it's time to change your password or not. Perfect advice there. And on that note, it's time to say goodbye. Looks like uh, we're going to have to make the show two hours. <laughs> um, uh, also to Susan. Susan said she was driving today listening to us, obviously via Bluetooth on her, her system. And yes, you can still listen to us on Bluetooth in your car, which is very, very nice and yeah. convenient. And she said uh, we made the road feel a lot shorter. And she actually had to drive slow at some stages to hear what we said. <laughs> So, I don't know if Brilliant. that's a compliment. <laughs> we made her drive slow, but thank God she wasn't in an accident. <laughs> no, I'm glad. I'm glad you enjoyed the show. I always enjoyed it. I feel like the time flies on the show. It does. That's why we're already seven minutes over. We need to extend it by another 53 minutes. Just 50 to 70 minutes. Yeah. yeah. Talk to the boss. But thanks so much for having me on another great week of Tech Plus, And I'll see you next week. And thanks so much to all of our listeners as well for listening in. And to you, Gain. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your week. Enjoy load shedding. And we'll see you next week if we can see. Because <laughs> if we can <laughs> see. <laughs> Cheers, man. Cheers, man. Bye-bye.